The other day I posted something about using a GLP-1 agonist in a Facebook group. We're talking about losing weight, fitness, things like that. And I posted about being on Manjaro and how it had helped me a lot. And within probably two minutes of me posting that, I started to get responses with, Be careful, you're going to lose muscle mass. And it was pretty off the charts. I'm not saying that those warnings weren't done with the best of possible intentions. I think that the people who were doing that were trying to help me out and had my best interest in mind, I believe. Uh, but really, is muscle loss on a GLP-1 agonist like Manjaro or Ozempic or similar, is it a foregone conclusion? I'm not a doctor, but I do have some thoughts and some at least conclusions about myself. Let me talk about it. Stick around. So if you've seen any of my other videos on the topic, of which I think I have a whopping two of them, you know that in February of 2023, I got on Manjaro and started taking that in conjunction with trying to lose weight. Because previous efforts to lose weight, I was a fat kid, man, nothing was working. I'm not gonna go into that. I, there's another video, maybe I'll put a link somewhere to it if you want the whole backstory. I did this and I've been doing it ever since to some degree or another, and I'll talk more about that. Uh, I have a lot of thoughts and some experience now with being on that medication. In addition, I know a handful of other people who are also using that or similar medications. While I don't know everything and I'm not a doctor, I'm not a nutritionist, I'm certainly not a physical trainer, and I'm not your doctor, okay, I'm not a healthcare professional or anything like that. Anything I tell you, I'm just some dude on the internet. Understand, like I said, I've I'm approached this with some amount of personal experience and a good deal of research that I've done in terms of reading, talking to actual medical professionals, and coming to some sort of conclusions. So I, I do wanna talk about it from a more informed and educated standpoint. I really wanna make it clear, this is not medical advice. If you wanna do anything to change your current health status, you really need to talk to your doctor. And while you're at it, if I were you, I would talk to a personal trainer and a nutritionist as well, because I don't think that doctors have all the answers. I think some of those cats are really smart, but I think that when it comes to certain aspects of physical fitness, you're gonna need more information than just what a doctor can provide for you. Now, one thing I will do in this video, and I'll, I'll get to it at the end, but I'll talk to you very specifically about what I did. Um, everything, step by step, I'll break it down. So if you wanna know what worked for me, I got you. And I'll, I think I can give you a really good picture of how I got where I am currently. But like I said, I'll do the breakdown at the end and I know, hey, I'm teasing you, but stick around. I think there's relevant information for you. So I have seen at least one doctor on YouTube cautioning against using any sort of GLP agonist medication like Manjaro. Almost without exception, every patient we've put on this drug has lost muscle mass. They are losing muscle mass at a way higher rate than they should. Uh, that doctor was saying, hey, this is gonna cause muscle loss and you don't want that. And I mean, the generic sentiment is true. You certainly don't want to lose muscle. But the doctor that I saw doing this was a bariatric surgeon. And bariatric surgeons make money from cutting on people to cause their gastrointestinal tracts to behave differently in terms of the nutrient capacity that they take in. And if you can come up with a way to lose weight that doesn't involve somebody doing some entertaining things to your intestines, then my doctor, my hypothetical doctor does not make money. I've also seen some personal trainers saying the same thing. Hey, don't take these drugs, you'll lose muscle mass. Instead, you should come see me for personal training. Now, I'm not saying that these guys have any malice or any ill will in their recommendations. And I'm not saying that a GLP-1 agonist type drug is a panacea, it is certainly not. But a lot of the people that I'm seeing who are talking about these drugs and telling you to not use them, all seem to have some sort of ulterior motive, at least from my perspective. So take what they say with a grain of salt, heck, take what I say with a grain of salt. So, you know, that aside, I, the things that I'm seeing, I sometimes wonder where they're coming from. And I guess that, that goes with anything. You know, I will say this, when you lose weight, if you're just going from, hey, I'm weighing 200 pounds and I weigh 180 pounds, that weight loss, is never going to be 100% fat, or at least odds are very far against. If you get into any sort of situation where you're eating less calories, you're likely to lose some muscle mass. Uh, you can 
fight it and you can do things to kind of help you not, I'll talk about that in a second, at least what worked for me, but some amount of lean body mass going away along with the fat mass is probably gonna happen. Now, with that said, if you were a severely obese individual and your thing that was stopping you from trying to lose weight was fear of losing muscle mass, I wonder where the heck your priorities are, especially if that obesity is coming with things like high blood pressure, um, elevated cholesterol, triglycerides, blood sugars, all the things that really start to take a serious toll on your health. Maybe at the end of the day, losing a little bit of muscle mass to lose some of the really bad weight is not a bad thing. Now, once again, that's an opinion, in my opinion, and not an MD's, but I don't know that if you lost a couple pounds of muscle to lose 10 or 20 pounds of fat, would you really be getting shortchanged in that equation? From my perspective, no, but I don't know. Everybody has to make their own decisions. Really, at the end of the day, I have a theory when it comes to the muscle loss or possible muscle loss that comes with these medications. And I base this on my own experience. I think that the medications in and of themselves don't really have a direct correlation on fat or muscle. What I saw in myself and what I see in a lot of others is that when you get on these medications, your appetite shrinks a lot to the tune of sometimes you don't even think to eat a meal and if you were not careful it would be very easy to barely eat all day and for somebody who didn't focus on the healthiest choices to begin with if you just eat a lot less of what you ate before that may not be enough to sustain that lean body mass and like i said from personal experience i feel that is kind of what happened with me I'll talk about it more in a second. But from my perspective, really having that reduction in appetite, and I get it, it's really easy to then not bother focusing on the things that will really help you retain your lean body mass. You know, if you normally eat a lot of junk food and then you get on a GLP-1 agonist and you just eat a little teeny bit of junk food, yeah, you'll probably lose weight, right? Because if you're in a caloric deficit, your body will shed pounds but the skew of what those pounds are because of what you're intaking may be different. I say all this because I personally saw that muscle loss in myself. When I first got on Manjaro, probably the first two months, I wasn't working out a lot and I didn't really heavily shift my diet. And when I looked in the mirror, I was like, oh, I'm losing muscle. Like I wish I had gotten a DEXA scan at that point so that I could see like on paper where my lean body mass was going like before I started and like two or three months into it, but I didn't and that's on me. One of the things I'd tell you is if you're getting ready to go on a weight loss journey, no matter how painful it would be to see what your actual numbers are right now, if you could go get a DEXA scan and get like a very detailed look at the amount of fat you're carrying around, the amount of muscle you're carrying around, the amount of bone mass you're carrying around, I think that that is super valuable because then 60, 90 days into your diet and your program, you can go get another DEXA scan and you can see what is happening, what the trend is. And shame on me for not doing that. I should have done it. Um, but when I started to really realize that I was losing muscle, I started to make some pretty strong changes in terms of what I was eating and in terms of my exercise because I wasn't really exercising much. I really started to focus on protein intake and you know as a 180 at that point 200 pound male I was trying to get darn close to one gram of protein for, per pound of body weight. I don't know that I always succeeded especially when my appetite was really wonky and I was having a hard time getting a consistent schedule in terms of feeding but I started focusing on protein and then I slowly but surely started adding in exercise. And I didn't get crazy, you know, I didn't go to the gym like right off the jump and just do like, okay, I'm gonna hours worth of heaviest weights I can stomach and another hour of cardio. I probably would have broken something if I had done that because at that point I wasn't really physically fit. So I didn't have the acclimatization to actually go and do that amount of exercise. I started slow. But over time, I started to kind of dial in my diet and I started to kind of dial in my exercise. And this took months. Don't get me wrong, it took months to get there. And over time, I, it started to even out. And to give you some idea, I think in May 
of this year, May of 2023, May 31st, I went and got a DEXA scan. And like I said, it was a point in time, it wasn't a good comparison. But then in the middle of August, I got another one. So what was that, like June, July, two and a half months later. So 30, 60, 75 days later, I went and got another DEXA scan and that was amazingly worthwhile. And I found that during those 75 days, I gained about 5.8 pounds of muscle and lost darn close to 11 pounds of fat in that exact same period of time. So if you look at the old school bodybuilder methodology or um, either cutting or bulking, I was losing weight but still gaining muscle because I had gone from I think 190s something to like 180s something during that time. So the equation was good. And I'm probably gonna go get another DEXA scan in November, probably right before Thanksgiving. Man, I'm, I'm pretty dialed in, but I'm only human. And when the holidays hit, man, I, I'm probably gonna eat. So I don't wanna stop that. But I'm gonna get another one and let's see what happens again. But in the, in the interim, and I don't know that I'm gonna be able to lose as much fat and gain as much muscle because it'll start to slow down because my weight hasn't shifted a lot. At this point, I think I'm kinda just hitting that maintenance but I'd love to see if it's changed at all in terms of fat or muscle. But like I said, I managed to gain muscle and lose fat while being on a GLP-1 agonist that entire time, once a week, taking shots. And so it's not a foregone conclusion, but I think you can, I think it's really easy to, especially if you eat without thinking and do you know the rest of your routine, kind of as you normally did, just less, you could, you know, whether that's something that you are worried about or not, like I said, talk to your doctor, there's a lot of factors. But for me, I, while on this medication, gained muscle and lost fat. So it is doable because I'm, I'm just a normal dude I'm, and, and an old dude at that, right? I'm in my 50s, so if I can do it, I think you can do it. Um, I definitely will go into the specifics and tell you exactly what I did. So the specifics in the order that I think they were most beneficial to me, one was getting on Manjaro. And I'm not saying this to say that you could not lose weight without getting on this medication. People have done it before, they'll do it again. But I know for me personally, I had tried a bunch of other things and they didn't work with me in terms of my willpower, my ability to stick with it. Those things weren't there for me. And so getting on that drug really started to push me down the road of where I needed to be. Understand that every drug out there has potential side effects and the GLP-1 class of drugs, they definitely have them. Most people experience gastrointestinal side effects and I was no different, like I definitely did. Although over time they have minimized and I have learned how to kind of deal with the ones that are left but the potential ones in rare cases can be severe. So I would not tell you just blanket, go get on a drug. There's no way, no how. This is something that you have to figure out the risk and reward and how it equates to you. And you need to do that with your doctor. Okay, do some research if this is something you're really interested in. But for me, it was a game changer, a completely different animal once I got on that drug because that drug really kind of put a foot on my butt and got me moving in the direction of the rest of this stuff. The second thing was diet. I had to learn how to eat again properly. I had to learn how to focus on protein, and that means most of my days, the vast majority of my food intake is like eggs, lean meats, protein shakes, some cheese, some nuts, not a lot of that. I don't eat a lot of bread. I eat, if I'm going to eat carbs, usually more potatoes or rice just because they're more naturally occurring and less processed. And whatever's left, I fill with vegetables like salads, broccoli, carrots, green beans, things like that. It doesn't mean I don't stray off the path. Doesn't mean I don't eat an occasional piece of candy. Doesn't mean I don't have an occasional dessert. Doesn't mean I don't have an occasional glass of wine or a cocktail or on the weekend, maybe even a few, okay? But a lot of those other less healthy dietary habits, I really reeled in and they are kind of much more rarities for me now. And that made a big, big difference, obviously, 
when you're eating well, it is easier for you to retain that lean body mass, uh, easier for you to get a good night's sleep, you feel better. Because understand that even with your reduced appetite, if you're still kind of eating poorly, while calories are calories to some degree, how I feel changes pretty radically based on what I have eaten in terms of calories. Now, I didn't use a fitness tracking application very much, uh, but I know a lot of people who are in, I guess I wanna say the GLP-1 community, a lot of them like my fitness pal. And I've used it in the past, and I just kinda of started using it again in the past few days. A lot of people get much better results when they're eating, when they are tracking or writing down everything that they're eating. And I think there's some psychology involved in that, I think because when you are writing down everything and you're tracking everything, you've got a very good handle on what exactly is going in. A lot of times we tend to eat without thinking. We snack without thinking. And I'm not saying that this is you because it's me. But my big thing was just kind of eating the same or similar stuff pretty regularly. And that was in effect how I tracked things. But if you don't do that as much, maybe something like MyFitnessPal will help you and it's free, there's a premium version of it, but you can legit just download it for free and just track everything that you're eating. You can track your exercise, you can track hydration, all kinds of stuff in it if you want. You can go as deep or as shallow with that as you wish, but if you're one of those people that has a hard time eating consistently, that might be a real big tool for you, maybe. The third thing is exercise, and I think exercise comes after diet. Uh, I've heard really competitive athletes and bodybuilders say that abs aren't made in the gym, they're made in the kitchen, and that's probably legit. If you're not eating properly, then exercise isn't going to help you. Uh, and I personally, especially once I got out of my 20s, I cannot outrun a fork. If I want to eat a whole pile of calories, there's no amount of exercise that I'm going to do that's going to make those calories completely melt away. I would have to be a competitive marathoner to do that and my joints won't put up with 26 mile runs. Heck, I don't know that they would when I was in my 20s, much less in my 50s. But to the exercise point, I started out really gently, daily walks. And I wasn't going really far or really fast, but over time I started to build in more time. I still to this day when I do cardio, don't really do more than 30 to 45 minutes. And so I'm not, I'm not like, oh my God, you gotta do a ton of cardio. What I think helps more than the cardio is actually lifting weights. And if you don't have access to a gym, you can do things like push-ups, body weight squats. If you have some place where you can hang a pull-up bar, and I realize that some people can't do pull-ups owing to the amount of upper body mass they have or lower body mass they have, depending on that equation. But if you can do that, it's an option. If you wanna get a small set of hand weights, that goes a long way. Heck, you can, you can do a lot with a set of like, twos, fives, tens, fifteens, and twenties. And you can go to like Walmart or something and pick those up. You know, if you have the ability to get to a commercial gym or a bigger gym, I don't think you need to become like a pro bodybuilder. I think if you focus on things like squats, deadlifts, bench press, some rows, you can do some isolation stuff. But I think really the bigger lifts, what people call compound lifts, where you're using multiple muscle groups, those seem to make the most difference in terms of how long you're in the gym versus what you get out of it. And as with anything, I'd tell you guys, make sure you talk to your doctor before you embark on a fitness program. See if you can come up with a program as specified by like a personal trainer. Like don't, don't do this cold, don't make up your own stuff. There's a lot of resources out there to help you. But like I said at the beginning, no matter what, try and get medically cleared. I mean, you're an adult, you can do what you wanna do but it's really easy to injure yourself, overdo it, or do some weird stuff. And when you don't know what you're doing in terms of your physical fitness program, then you're kind of just wandering around in the wilderness hoping you find something. You know, having somebody to coach you and guide you, that is super worthwhile. I'm very lucky and fortunate in that uh, my office is right next door to a guy who has probably forgotten more about exercise physiology than I'll ever know. And so, you know, my basic beginner program and a lot of other things I just get from him and bounce ideas off of him, and that, that got me a long way. If you don't work right next to an individual like that, it might behoove you to seek one out. Because like I said, I'm not that guy. But exercise is really kind of that, that finisher on top of everything else 
to really retain that lean body mass, keep you strong, keep you fit. There's one more thing I do want to mention, and that's supplements. And a lot of people get supplement crazy, like that's their first quiver in the arsenal, or first arrow in the quiver, I'm sorry. But I don't think that supplementation is going to help you unless you've gotten your diet and your exercise taken care of. I think if you're not doing either of those other things properly, then all supplements are going to do is separate you from your cash, which certainly look, the vitamin shop and any of those guys out there would be more than happy to take your money. And uh, so I'm not saying, you know, don't, but at the end of the day, if you're not really uh, working a good diet and some sort of exercise program, I think that a lot of supplements are going to be of dubious worth to you. Now, I do want to preface what I'm getting ready to say with the fact that, guys, I take a lot of supplements, but most of them I'm not taking because of weight maintenance at this point. Uh, a lot of them I'm taking for longevity, general blood sugar control, lipid control, things like that because um, I'm super worried about arterial plaque and everything else. But the two I want to mention in terms of exercise, uh, and they're two that are not expensive, and they're readily available, easy to get. And there's a ton of research on both. And the first is caffeine. Caffeine is the most researched supplement on the planet in the history of time. And there is a ton of information about it, so you can do your own research. Uh, but I'll tell you that getting your metabolism going, keeping your brain focused. Caffeine does an amazing job of this and it's cheap. Now I get mine from a cup of coffee and I drink enough to where I get about 200 to 250 milligrams of caffeine and I get it early in the day so it does not disrupt my sleep. Some people I know like energy drinks, some people like pre-workouts. If you are not somebody who's already acclimatized to caffeine, I would tell you to go really, really gently and especially be careful with some of those pre-workouts or energy drinks. I have seen on more than one occasion somebody who was not a caffeine consumer whatsoever go and shoot down a monster or a bunch of energy drink or pre-workout to try and get a leg up and then they end up on the gym floor clutching their chest because they got heart palpitations. Like no lie, I've had to see medics summoned because somebody decided to jump into the deep end of the caffeine pool. Please don't do that. You can go gently, but caffeine is a very worthwhile supplement. And like I said, it's cheap, it's readily available. The second one is creatine, probably the second most researched supplement on the planet. And creatine is good for your muscles and it is good for your brain. And for those two perspectives alone, I take it. And it is dirt cheap. You can get like two months supply for like 20, 25 bucks. You can get it flavored, unflavored. You can get it powdered. You can get it in capsules. You can get it along with other stuff. I just take plain creatine, uh, although I've been getting some great flavored stuff recently, and that's pretty good too. For the most part, creatine is safe for anybody, but I know that if you have any kidney issues or anything like that, you definitely want to stay away from creatine. That's one of those things you should check with your doctor first. Please do. And that or anything else for that matter. But, you know, anytime you want to take something where there is some possible negative, uh, I would just double check. Uh, for me, creatine is something that, uh, while it doesn't make me feel super powered, I can definitely tell a difference physically and mentally from taking it. Now, like I said, this is a drop in the bucket. I take a bunch of other stuff. And if you want me to uh, talk about all the supplements that I take and why I take them, I would have to do a whole nother video. If that's something you're interested in, just hit me in the comments and let me know. But that's as far as I want to go right now. So like I said, the drug I got on, Manjaro, the diet, cleaning up my diet, getting a decent exercise program, and then proper and quality supplementation, that was what really got me where I am right now. And hopefully will keep me there. It's been nine months since I started, coming up on 10. So this is really a short term, right? You're looking at short term J, not long term J. But let's hope we can keep this going. Okay, I'm gonna finish this up. I don't wanna take any longer. I know this video has gone long enough. If you are considering doing any or all of the things that I have talked about that work for me, then I'm gonna just reiterate one last time, talk to a healthcare professional. I do want you to be healthier, I do. Uh, one of my friends who's also a medical doctor, I was talking to him about GLP-1 agonists and he said that he thinks these drugs are a game changer in terms of obesity and type 2 diabetes. And he thinks that as they become more common 
and we understand more and more about them that the face of obesity and diabetes will change. I hope he's right because I know while there are all kinds of things that can kill you, the statistics that I read about obesity related mortality have anywhere from 200,000 a year to 400,000 a year uh, deaths in the United States. And it depends on whose numbers you look at. But on the bottom end, 200,000 people a year die from obesity related mortality. And like I said, if you look at some of the higher estimate, it just gets worse. To give you some comparison, opioids kill about 100,000 a year in this country. So obesity kills double that. It is probably another addiction, right? It is in some ways, I suppose, worse than opioids because like I said, it is killing more people and it is certainly legal to eat as much as you want, whereas opioids tend to be fairly heavily controlled in terms of pharmacologically and in terms of legality. Nothing exists like that for food. And by the way, I'm not suggesting it should. God help us, I don't want the government trying to control what I eat any more than they already do. Most would say that's far enough. For the most part, ladies and gentlemen, I don't usually talk about health-related concerns. Most of my videos don't have anything to do with that. But I do appreciate you watching all the way up to this point. Uh, I do appreciate you. If you have any questions, comments, or concerns, hit me up in the comments, and you're more than welcome to message me as well through whatever means. You can look on my website, my email's there if you really wanna go that route. Most of my content is more firearms related, knives, flashlights, EDC stuff. Occasionally I talk about booze because I do like a good cocktail every now and again. That's my normal. If those things interest you, then a subscription will definitely get you more content just like that. But as I've gotten a little more health conscious, I tend to veer off into this direction every now and again, so you may see some more content like this too. I'll end this here. Ladies, gentlemen, take care, stay safe, and I'll talk to you soon. Get him, Jay.